Hello. Um, thank you very much for coming. Warm welcome. Um, I'm Kate Bassett, and I'm the literary associate here at Chichester Festival Theatre. And I'm going to be talking this evening to the wonderful director, Rachel Kavanagh, who has obviously staged Shadowlands. Um, I'm just to fill you in, we're going to be talking for about 20 minutes, uh, and then I'm going to open it up to a Q&A uh, for about 10 minutes. So do be mulling on and saving up your questions for then. Um, but let me introduce Rachel, who I'm sure many of you already know, because uh, you've had a whole raft of acclaimed productions here already. Um, many of them, I'm thinking of The Winslow Boy, Single Spies, Alan Bennett's very intriguing um, and witty play. Uh, and lots of musicals, including the incredibly buoyant Half a Sixpence, which is unforgettably enjoyable. Um, and also, you've been Artistic Director of Birmingham Rep for several years, and you have lots of RSC productions, lots of other West End productions, and transfers from Chichester as well. So, thank you very much for being here tonight amongst your pleasure. busy CV. Um, I suppose I was going to ask you a rather fundamental question to start with, which is what drew you to Shadowlands or what do you or what in the process of rehearsal what have you come to cherish about it in particular well I mean the thing is the best job is always the one you've just been offered and um I, I didn't choose the play Daniel chose the play and asked me to do it at, at which point I was already very keen on it because I've been asked to do it and I had a kind of distant memory of what it was and um, I can talk a bit more later about my history with it. Um, and he asked if I would have a chat with Hugh Bonneville and because he was keen to play C.S. Lewis and that seemed a very, very exciting and good idea. And I read the play and I thought, I'm gonna read it. I was rehearsing Christmas Carol for the RSC and I thought I'll read it on my way in to work, uh, which turned out to be a foolish decision as I sat on the G1 bus in floods of tears thinking, okay, right, it's got me the first time. It's a very wonderful and human story. And then about a week later, I thought, I'd better read the play again before I start talking to the designer. And this time I was on the tube, and I thought it'd be absolutely fine this time. <laughs> but no! <laughs> and there I was, mascara down my face again. And I think the kind of easy answer is part of that, in that there's something in it which touched me very deeply and very suddenly in, in the play. And uh, I'm always very drawn to theatre, which has an emotional story. I like doing shows about, about relationships, about families, about love in all its forms. But I like, I like psychology and drama and human relationships. That, that, and, and I particularly like stories are where people or a protagonist shifts. I suppose, you know, something like Christmas Carol that happens in, and it happens in this play, where the, the, the central character has a, a big shift in, in his being when he grows to love another human being. And that, that's a very wonderful story to tell, someone who's completely um, closed up, who allows himself to open up to love and then all the risks that come with love. It's a really fascinating comparison, actually, isn't it, with the Dickens Christmas Carol? But it's, it is kind of a, an opening of the heart, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. And in stories. fact, um, Scrooge is mentioned in Shadowlands. I won't say the line because it is a bit of a treat. Um, <laughs> and the actor who says it, Tim Watson, does it a great deal better than I would. But um, yes, that there is, a, there is a, an allusion to Christmas Carol in, in Shadowlands. <laughs> And is there anything in particular, I mean, you're talking about the psychology uh, of the characters. Is there anything that you find particularly fascinating or touching about? So it's, it's basically C.S. Lewis and his American admirer, probably most of you know, but his American admirer, who's also has been a writer, um, Joy, who comes to meet him and they have a developing friendship. Um, well, the, it's, it's very interesting to chart uh, 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 the journey of a relationship where one, one person is quite clear to themselves on what they feel about the other one and the other one is in a whole range of denials and inabilities to articulate, and actually inabilities to express or even feel what he might want to until disaster strikes. And that, that's quite fun. Also with two very, very intellectually intelligent 
characters, one of whom is emotionally intelligent and one of whom is, is like a child, emotion, not like a child, that's not fair, but who is closed in emotionally. And that, that's a lovely thing to play with in rehearsals and see, you know, if we, if we do that in that scene, can we go to that in that scene? And of course, relationships aren't linear, so they can go backwards as well as forwards on that journey. And, and that's been a really fun thing to do. Also with the character of Joy, who a lot of the other characters, all men, find to be outrageous and difficult and loud and opinionated about how we pitch that. You know, is that just their opinion in the 1950s? She was an extraordinary woman, but would we find her presence in a room now that unusual? They do, because there are a load of dons in the 1950s in Oxford who only really like talking to each other. But that, that's been a really interesting thing for me and, and Liz White, who is very brilliant as Joy, to, to find, I mean, what, what is it about her that they are so threatened by? And would she, to us, appear to be a, just a, a rather bright woman? Mm -hmm. She has some corking lines as she well, does. She? <laughs> She's she not frightened. Witty repasts, <laughs> yes. Um, do you, would, could you say a little bit about it in broader terms, about what you think William Nicholson was exploring thematically uh, in the play, beyond, I suppose, well, including love and friendship and the borderlines between that, but other issues as well? Um, it was very interesting talking to Bill about the genesis of Shadowlands, because it was... Um, it was written first as a, as a television drama and it was made in the religious department of the BBC. And he was asked to write a, a, a piece of religious drama. And he said, oh, I'll write about C.S. Lewis. And he's, he's very open about this, so he won't mind me saying. He was finding himself at a moment in his life where he was trying to gain success as a writer and was having a series of failed relationships, all of which were with women who said that he was unable to commit to them. So he was very interested, I think, in the what is it that sometimes allows, in his case and in C.S. Lewis's case, a man to not be able to open themselves up to the, the commitment, the pain, the possible pain, the joy, the kind of loss of control when you uh, fall in love and then embark on a life with another human being. So that's... That's very much his starting point for it, I think. And so it's very personal in that way to him. And he found this rather great fit, which meant that it could then be produced by the religious department of the BBC because of C.S. Lewis's... C.S. Lewis obviously being a very religious man, a committed Christian, and the whole, you know, the whole the idea of the Narnia books being kind of allegory, but also all the many books C.S. Lewis wrote about Christianity. So I think that he's... At its heart, that's what it's about. It's about someone who is closed opening up, I think. But it's also about fear of the other. It's about, um, it's about loss. And it's ultimately about, uh, for, for Lewis and, and Joy, and about, you know, what, is there anything beyond the life that we are... We are um, experiencing at this moment when we are alive you know he, he, he says right at the beginning of the play that this this life that we're all in at the moment is the shadowlands the real life comes later but um what's so brilliant about the writing is that everything lewis says really um or a lot everything a lot of the characters say in the first half is become can is shot down or changed or questioned by the events of the play in the second half yeah that's really fascinating because i was going to say you know it's, it's quite it's very intriguing that it was um commissioned by the religious department yeah. i was kind of intrigued by by how they received it because in a way it's it's very complex about um grief isn't yeah. it grief and faith yeah and and whether that shakes your faith or you, or it or your faith brings you through the grief Exactly. I think that's absolutely right. And, and that when Lewis talks about the death of his mother when he was eight and Joy asks him, you know, did he believe he'd see her again? And he says, no, she was gone. That was all. But because he found actually faith after that, because he didn't allow himself into that first bit of grief when his mother died. He found faith later. And, but, but his faith was never tested 
in the way it's tested in the events of the play when he had grown to be incredibly fond of Joy. At that point, he still thought of her as his friend, but how, I think how he feels when she becomes ill is, is a, like a big wake-up call to him. And there's some wonderful stuff. I don't want to talk too much about it, because I don't know how... Have most of you seen it already? No, well, I don't want to talk about it. But later on in the play, where he is asked about his faith by his brother and by Joy's child, and he questions himself about it, and he, he, things are really rocked for him. And he finds it hard to answer the questions that he answered very easily before he met her. It's, um, I, this isn't in the play, so it's not a spoiler. I was just reading a bit about um, C.S. Lewis uh, beyond the play. And there's a sort of wonderful bit where he says that he, he did in real life have, have waves of faith and loss of faith. And he was, I think Tolkien was another Oxford Don who, who brought him towards Christianity at, at, at one point. And he said something like, um, they went on a bike ride to Whipsnade Zoo. And he said, I didn't believe in God at the start, but by the time I got to the zoo, I did. <laughs> It's a sort of Damascan moment, isn't I don't it? Know. I wonder what that was. <laughs> yes, I don't know. <laughs> and how could you have a conversation on a motorbike on the way to Whipstate? Well, it's very Zoom, good. I like obviously, it, Dons can do that. <laughs> um, did you? Did you also, from your first reading or in the process of rehearsals, come to particularly admire anything about William Nicholson's craft? As a right, is there anything that stands out for you about the play? Well, it's partly what I what I touched on just then is that. It, it, it's incredibly well constructed in that ideas are laid out. And you think, where, when's that going to come back? And everything has a sort of mirror image of itself or an answer at some point later in the play. So the play begins with Lewis giving a lecture in which he makes many statements about the nature of faith and love and God and suffering. And... At various points in the drama, all of those are answered or questioned or upheld. And um, it, so it's, it, in essence, quite kind of antithetical, the writing, sometimes within itself in a small space of lines, and sometimes an hour later, an answer will come back to something that was flagged up early in the play. And um, I like that very much. Um, Bill is, is very keen, which is unusual sometimes in theatre, on allowing thinking space in, in, in the story. And, and you know, it, sometimes, you know, in life, sometimes we speak before we think or as we think. And often in theatre, one's trying to get actors to, to speak and think at the same time. <laughs> but some, he, he, he was very interesting about moments in this play where actually it's quite interesting to watch someone think and then see what they're going to say. <laughs> And so that, that, that's a really unusual and lovely thing to hear. And, um, but there's also lovely things that we're just finding now. I was talking to two of the actors earlier this afternoon about there's two lines that answer each other. He has quite um, unusual construction sometimes in the sentences where he'll say something and something and something. It happens a few times and then another character will answer and I have this to do and this and this. So there's just, there's lovely things to dig for in it, in, in the writing. It's, it's, it's not uh, a, a, an emotional story to manipulate you. It's very, very well constructed as an argument always, because the characters are also clever as well, which I think is really helpful. And it's quite funny, some of it. It is. No, it's, I actually really like that about the Oxford Dons as well, that, that exactly what you're saying, that, that it's like they're people who think, they have it, they're asking big ideas and they're thinking, and they're quite witty, which I think is true of the philosophical period, actually, yeah. in the mid-20th century, and philosophy was quite kind of playful yeah. and bantery. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to ask you a bit about um, your methods of, of preparing, I suppose, and pre-researching when you're directing something. Did you watch the TV version or the film version? Did you do lots of historical research? Do you always? Does it vary? Varies a bit. Um, with a, with a, when you're doing a play, I think, which has real characters, historical characters, I think 
you're kind of honor bound to do some research. And um, I uh, did, along with my brilliant assistant, we did do some research on C.S. Lewis's life, on his works. I read A Grief Observed, which is the really beautiful, um, well, it's a sort of long essay, sort of short book that he wrote after Joy died about his own um, journey through grief. And I read also the extraordinarily named Prized by Joy, which is the autobiographical story of his childhood, which he wrote before he met her. And it's called Surprised by Joy. And then he met a woman called Joy and fell in love with her. It's just, it's the most extraordinary coincidence. And that's a wonderful story of his, uh, 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 and there's some fantastic stuff about his school days and his relationship with his brother, which is very strong in the play, I think, the relationship with Warney, his older brother. And so that, that was all very good. And then we did some research about his life and lots of research about Joy, because actually, apart from her relationship with Lewis, she's not, she's not very well known as a writer, but she was a good poet and a good writer and acclaimed. She, she says in the play, I won a poetry prize, which I shared with Robert Frost. You know, she was up there as a major American poet, but she's been sort of forgotten in her own right, I think, and is remembered as, as the wife of C.S. Lewis. Um, so we found out about her and also um, this was in the last 10 years, um, Douglas, her son, wrote an article in The Guardian about his experiences of meeting C.S. Lewis for the first time. And, and, and all that stuff was available and good. And then there's a moment for me where you read it, you absorb it, you chat about it on the first few days of rehearsal, and then you kind of have to let it go. Because we're doing William Nicholson's version of this story. We're not, it's no good if you come up against something in the play and you go, but actually that took three years in real life. Because we're not doing real life, we're doing a play about it. And, and, and it's really important, I think, to, to be very clear about that. We're not doing a documentary. We're doing uh, William's account of, of this relationship. And we can know those things and they can feed into what we do. But that's not what we're dramatising. Yeah, so there's a rather fascinating photo in the programme of Hugh looking at a photo on the wall, the yes, research wall. Yes, lovely that. Looking at a photo of C.S. Lewis. And I was thinking, that's really complex, isn't it? Yeah. That you, as an actor, really complex, that you're, you're trying to find the essence of that person, but probably these days, or in particular in the centre, don't want to do an impersonation. No, I think sometimes you're trying to find what is it in them that you can bring close to mm. you, or what is it, where do you two meet? Yeah. Yes, I think there's no sense of trying to be like him, or like, with his, like, like his voice, or like mm. his mannerisms. Yeah. I think there's a sense of what, where do we two meet, mm -hmm. I think, probably. Yeah. yeah, and what's the common ground that, exactly. that we can emotionally yeah. connect on. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's probably just about time to open it up to questions. There's a gentleman uh, a few rows back. Yeah, thank you. I, I have actually seen the production. I came a couple of days ago and loved it. Um, when One of the things that surprised me was how funny it was. You, you mentioned that it was, I think you said it was quite funny. I think it's actually very funny in places. Was that something that you also recognised when you were in floods of tears on your bus, or did it emerge in rehearsals? It emerged in rehearsals, to be completely honest with you, and it emerged even more on Friday evening. Um, I think it, sometimes when you rehearse and you live with a script for lots of weeks, you forget sometimes that things are funny. You, you're kind of aware of it, and Bill kept saying, you know, they will laugh. And we were going, yes, yes, we'll, we'll, they'll laugh. And then they really did. And that was really lovely. And what was surprising was how long the laughs go, where, where, have been, you know, that, that it's quite late into the play that people stop laughing, and that's a great thing. It might all be different tonight, who knows? But, um, uh, and I think that part of um, Bill's methods are that if you can laugh and you're already having a lovely emotional time in the theatre that's laughing, you're more likely to be moved, I think. And I think that that's true, because those two things can come up against each other quite closely. And, um, uh, and he... he he's always been very clear that it's very important that the audience are allowed to laugh. So I'm glad that you did find it very funny. Maybe I was using quite in the Elizabethan sense of absolutely. No, I wasn't, but <laughs> no, but thank you. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Um, and there's, a, there's a hand over there, um, the back row there. Why this story now? That's a very good question. I mean, I, I think that it, it's, it's, it's not particularly a story for now. I think it's a story for always. 
because we are always going to be human beings who are in a universe where we might want to cling on to each other and then we are going to experience grief and loss. I mean, I, I suppose if, if particularly, I, I, it's what I said at the beginning, I think I, I, like, I like telling stories of, of relationship and emotion. And I think there is, a, it has big questions in it about love and loss and faith and grief. And it also has detail of, of relationship in it, which is entertaining and, and a very precise world to create. So that, that's a lovely contrast to do. But I think that it's, it's always going to be a play worth doing because it's about something which at some point will affect everybody who comes to see it. And, and, and that, that's, that's a lovely thing. Yeah, I, th I think that's that's really interesting. That in a way, those plays like that are, are more timeless. Yes, because they continue to be just about human relationships. And though I did also think, not in any sort of crass way, but what you were saying about her as a woman within the within a exclusively male uh, set of dons did slightly reverberate with things like Me Too, in that she sort of stood up for herself. Yes, and that you know that was it was a sort of moment of pre-feminist kind of sparkiness in a way with, with humour but the, 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 that resonated a bit and there's a, there's a wonderful moment in the first scene where one of the dons who's trying to be liberal says some women are very clever you know <laughs> and exactly the, the, it, that gets a kind of response now that it may or may not have got 20 years ago and do, do you mean so that, that, that we have a kind of hyper awareness at the moment about gender politics which is fantastic and so though exactly so you all laughed even with me saying it and so, so that there's a there's a there's a deliciousness in all of that stuff in the play which does feel i'm always nervous of words like current and relevant yeah, yes but, exactly but it doesn't but feel like that it's because it's not that kind of play but what because it's a very good play and it's about something to use a dreaded word universal it's shifting with the time it's being produced in does that make sense so that so that we we receive it with slightly different ears than when it was last done whenever that was however many yeah. years ago and also there's just some, i think there's something fascinating to see um, a piece set in period and to see what the differences are exactly. from, you know that's fascinating to go gosh that's that's what the thinking was or what the normal social behaviour was. And I think that's also true about the religious themes, actually, that had it been, a, you know, a very hot topical play, it would have been about fundamentalist Christianity or fundamentalist religion now, whereas it's this very sort of subtle, ambiguous exploration of um, Christian faith. Exactly, and about man and, and your own relationship with God. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, another question. If there's a, a hand up anywhere? Yeah, there's the two back up there. There's a gentleman in the aisle and then, oh yeah, we could either, we'll, I'll come to whichever one of you. Thank you. Has the author been involved with the rehearsal process and has the play changed um, with his agreement from what it, when it was produced 20 years ago? Uh, when when uh, I was first sent the script and I was meeting Peter McIntosh, the designer, and we obviously we both know this stage very well and this theatre, and it, it's very apparent when you read it that it had origins on the screen because there's a lot of short scenes in lots of different locations and we've had to find our own way of creating a theatrical language to tell that story. But there was one bit where they were downstairs, they were upstairs in the house, and then they came back down, and then they went to sleep, and then they were magically downstairs again. And I said to Bill, we can't, I don't see how we can do this on the Chichester stage without lots of architecture. And I don't want lots of architecture. I want to tell the story in a really simple way. And he rewrote that section for us. The script that we're using is, a, so it was a TV play, then it was done on stage, then it was a movie, and then it was re... Some elements of the movie are in the script that we are... There's the basis of our production. So it's not exactly the same script that Nigel Hawthorne uh, used when it was originally done on stage. It's got what the Bill's favourite bits from the film in. So uh, we go to... They go... They travel to Hereford rather than Greece in... <laughs> 
in, in, in our story. And, and Bill, Bill has been in, he, I had one meeting with him and a lot of phone calls before rehearsals. Then he came to see the model before we started. He came to the read through and he's come a couple of times to rehearsals and always been incredibly generous and supportive. He works a lot in movies now. And I think he's, he's, he likes being in a theater environment because we're, we're, we're much nicer to writers. <laughs> than they are in Hollywood. Yes. Yeah. Um, got one more quick question. I think there was, there's a gentleman there. just behind you, Jill. Thank you. When I came to see Half a Sixpence, which you produced here, the night that I saw it, you were actually sitting in the audience taking notes throughout the whole production. How long do you actually keep on uh, tweaking the play that you're producing? So we, um, we started previewing on Friday last week. So we did two previews last week, and then we opened to the press on Thursday of this week. So I will be in tonight, tomorrow, and Thursday. And then, in th then I'm kind of done, except I will come back and see it during the run and note it. But my sort of everyday presence finishes on Thursday with the opening night. And that's fairly standard for freelance directors, that you are, you're contracted to, to be full-time on the show, um, through rehearsals, technical rehearsals, previews, and up to press, up to and including press night. Um, but half a sixpence was a very, very extended preview period. Usually on a musical, that whole process is longer because they're often technically more complicated. So, it, you know, if it was a, music, a big musical here, the, the previews might go into the beginning of the following week. Yeah. Um, sadly, I think it's time to wind up because the floor has to be polished. Um, <laughs> So thank you very much for those very thought-provoking questions and thank you enormously to Rachel Kavanagh for brilliantly illuminating. <laughs>